Back again, what happens to a packet when you send it, uh, by Glyph Lifkowitz. Hi, everybody. Alrighty, so can everybody hear me okay in the back, front? Good? All right. So uh, I'm Glyph. You may know me from uh, such works as the Twisted Framework and more of the Twisted Framework. Um, this is uh, a talk about what happens to a packet when you send it, so I'm here today to tell you what. Uh, first, let me give you a map of the ether. Um, we're going to be taking you through uh, your program, which is just uh, haplessly trying to send some data. Then it has to go through Python, or more specifically, uh, because the prog whole program is presumably in Python, uh, Python's interface to the C library, socketmodule.c. That hands the data off to your kernel. Then your kernel has to shove uh, that stuff into the Ethernet card, which generates electrical impulses to send to a router which gets sent off to more routers and more routers and uh, so on and so forth until it gets closer to its end point, at which point the process goes in reverse. Uh, it arrives as electrical impulses on somebody else's Ethernet card, uh, which tells their kernel, uh, which tells Python, which hopefully delivers the data unmolested to your code. Um, it won't, and I'm going to tell you why, <laughs> but uh, I'll start by talking about your program. Uh, this entire talk is going to be about this one short program. Uh, I'm only going to talk about transmitting stuff over the internet. That's the AF INET argument. We're not going to transmit stuff over IPX or over Bluetooth. Um, and I'm only going to talk about TCP. That's the SOC stream part. Uh, this talk specifically, though, is about how this one short program is a lie. Uh, so we're going to... Now we're down here. Uh, Socket.send is Python's job. Uh, so this is where we are in the doc diagram. Uh, when you call Socket.send, you probably think it's making a promise to you like this. You send some data. Somebody receives the data. That's not what happens, though. Socket.send uh, means that you send some data. Then the internet happens to your data. Then, if you're lucky, some of it will get through sometimes. Um, so this is, I'm going to explain what happens to your data in transit and why that's interesting to you. Uh, <laughs> it's always a mystery uh, what happens to your data. So let's dive into the function and see what happens. So Python's easy, right? Everybody loves Python. Python's so easy. It's so easy to understand. Socket module dot C is 5,000 lines of C. Uh, it usually racks, wraps the underlying POSIX or standard C calls very lightly, uh, but not always, and it's important to know that. So t let's take a look at one function from socket module dot C. Uh, for starters, we're just going to look at the uh, send method of the socket object. This is one of the simplest parts of the process, but as you can see, it's not all that simple barely fits on a slide. Normally, I give people a hard time about making slides like this. But the whole point of this slide is so that you can see it's hard to squeeze even this one very simple uh, function on here. Um, but even in this extremely simple function, there's something you need to be aware of. Uh, send sort of wraps send, but it's got some bonus logic in there. If you specify a timeout on your socket, uh, you're not just calling your operating system send function. You, because send doesn't actually take a timeout in real life, uh, Python will helpfully call a multiplexer for you, like select or poll, and it depends how your Python was compiled, which one it's going to call, and each one gives different error codes, and you know there's a whole universe of complexity there that you might have to deal with. So if it happens that this socket's not suitable for multiplexing, for example, if your Python is compiled without poll, and the socket number happens to be high enough, you'll get an error. It doesn't really tell you what's going on. Uh, so this is an extra error condition you need to be aware of, and we haven't even tried to send data over the internet yet. This is not even down to send. Uh, 
Uh, of more immediate practical concern, though, is this line here at the bottom, which you probably can't even see at all. Uh, it returns an integer. Socket.send returns an integer. And that's really important because that tells you how many bytes were sent. So let's go back to the original program that I put up. Um, notice how nobody's bothering to track the results of socket.send. Uh, if send didn't send the whole thing, then it didn't get sent. The trick here is that if you want to send all the bytes, you have to do socket.send all instead. However, um, that involves relying on even more code in Python, which doesn't correspond exactly to the particular C library call, uh, which means even more error conditions that you might have to check on, uh, which means even more stuff that you have to be intimately familiar with the details of both Python and your platform's uh, semantics. So, uh, plus, just the fact that you've asked to send all the data doesn't mean that you can send all the data. So, you have to check some exceptions and then see, make sure, try again if certain things happen or close the socket. So, uh, the next... Ooh, my diagrams aren't showing up, I'm sorry. Um, uh, following the send system call on down, though, the next place that we end up is the, uh, the C library. Luckily, nothing really interesting goes on there. It just copies data into the kernel. Um, there's no extra buffers or extra things that you can uh, encounter in terms of errors. Uh, unless you're on Windows, <laughs> in which case there's some horrible stuff that maps between sockets and handles and windows and window handles, and I don't have nearly enough time to cover that in this talk. So. Moving on down, uh, after Python and libc are done with it, we go down one more layer into the kernel. So there are multiple layers to the kernel itself. Uh, you've got your system call. Your system call puts data into the TCP stack. TCP stack puts data into the Ethernet driver. So the system call is the thing that goes from your program to the kernel. The TCP stack is the thing that keeps track of all the state associated with a socket. And the Ethernet driver is the thing that actually pushes bytes out onto the wire. Um, in order to cover all these layers, I'm going to be talking about representative snippets from Linux 3.2, but the general ideas here should apply pretty much to all operating systems. Uh, a lot of incomplete C snippets are going to be flying by here, so uh, again, slides full of super dense code. Um, hopefully I'm going to advance this slide before you've had an opportunity to finish reading it, but this is a stack trace all the way through the Linux kernel from at the bottom there, you've got sys socket call, which is the syscall for send in Linux. And then all the way at the top, you've got dev hard start transmit, which is right before you get to a specific Ethernet driver. Uh, so there's a little bit of indirection to get started. Uh, send is the system call. Uh, the system call works its way into the TCP stack. Uh, the top few layers are really doing indirection, where uh, different address families and socket types such as Bluetooth or Unix, sockets, uh, might have different implementations than TCP. Uh, doing esoteric checks that you probably don't care about for security and stuff, so we'll, we'll skip over those layers. Uh, eventually, a syscall on whatever platform you're using boils down to some code like this. Something that looks up a function pointer. That, those are little C arrow operators down there. Um, in a table that's based on or related to the address family and the type of the socket in question. So this is how we get from, I want to send something to time to send some TCP. Uh, in our case, we only care about TCP sockets, so this is the AFI net sock stream stuff I talked about at the beginning. The TCP implementation uh, in the kernel populates a table full of function pointers when it's initialized. Um, and so your uh, send message member of the uh, TCP prot struct points at TCP send message. TCP send message um, does a bunch of stuff relating to sending the data. This is just a little bit of a snippet uh, to show you one sort of thing that happens in kernel implementations of this stuff. It tries to allocate uh, some memory, and then if it can't, it jumps out and goes somewhere else. Um, again, same function, tries to allocate a page, if it can't, it has to go wait for some memory. Uh, there's multiple kinds of giving up when you're waiting for memory. One is to simply refuse to write all the data that's given, making that integer smaller than the length of the string that you passed in to send. Uh, one is uh, to actually give up completely and raise an error. 
So you get all kinds of fun error conditions that come out of socket.send and socket.receive. Um, mostly these out of memory conditions will pass silently as far as your code is concerned. Um, but the man page for send is illuminating in terms of what kind of surprising conditions and exceptions might be raised. Next layer down, we need to get to the hardware. Um, eventually, the TCP implementation needs to talk to your Ethernet card, and it calls down into the abstract device code. So this ops member here is another struct full of function pointers. That arrow is another place where this interaction is happening because everybody has a different Ethernet card and your kernel has to figure out which one you're using. Um, again, the specific driver implementation is going to fill out a struct that points at its particular version of each operation that a physical Ethernet card can perform. Uh, this one happens to be from the Marvell driver just because the uh, the guy that happened to help me write this talk knew that one. Thanks, Pavel. Um, so, but I would like to take a peek at this one extra function in this struct really quickly. Uh, the open function for this Ethernet driver, which is the thing that gets called when the card is inserted into the machine or at boot, um, when it's first opened, it re requests an IRQ, which is to say it associates a hardware event with a function pointer. And uh, again, in this case, it's Linux specific, it's Marvell specific, but this general principle applies to pretty much any card. Um, most of the stuff in the TCP implementation is just putting some stuff into memory and then waiting until later. And later is when the Ethernet card says, time to do something. And the way it says time to do something is it sends an interrupt to the CPU, the CPU wakes up the kernel and calls this function that's been previously registered. Uh, nothing ever actually happens until the hardware is ready. In other words, nothing ha actually happens until a network event occurs. You may have heard I like event-driven stuff. Uh, but the reason I like event-driven stuff is because that's how reality works, and that's what this code is telling you, is that that's what your hardware is actually doing. Uh, now that we're done with the kernel, we're on to the Ethernet card. Um, at this point, hopefully, some electrical impulses come out of the ports on this thing. Uh, alternately, they might come out of your Wi-Fi radio, um, which is almost exactly the same, actually. Wi-Fi and Ethernet are very, very similar. Um, or your cellular radio, which is close enough. Uh, once you've reached the hardware, some stuff happens. Uh, <laughs> Now, the important thing about this slide is that your Ethernet card has bugs in it. And unlike the bugs in your software, they will never be fixed. You are stuck with them forever, and your kernel is stuck with them forever. Packets just get dropped. Um, your cats might rub against your leg and make you shock your keyboard, and that'll generate too much uh, voltage across a particular lead, and then suddenly your uh, packet gets dropped. Um, so now, having seen a picture of kittens, we're ready to move on to the Internet. <laughs> And the internet is all about kittens and lies. Uh, lots of stuff lies to you. Uh, Python lies to you about calling send when it calls select. Your kernel lies to you because it says, oh, sure, send whatever you want, but then it runs out of memory. Your hardware lies to you because it's probably full of bugs, but your kernel's papering them all over. And I lied to you. Remember this slide? Well, uh, actually, one of the words on this slide is a lie. It turns out, as far as you're concerned, there is no such thing as a packet. This is a word that's used all over the place in networking literature and conversations. And it means something very specific, and it means something that unless you are an Ethernet engineer or a kernel hacker, you're unlikely to ever interact with. Um, TCP, oops, I'm sorry. TCP sends a stream of bytes. When you put more bytes onto that stream, the only thing that you know is they'll be delivered in some order, in some chunking. Uh, they may be received in little pieces. They might be smashed together in big pieces. If you send two pieces, you might get one. If you send one piece, you might get six. You can't know. TCP packets are things with headers on them. Uh, this is the essence of a TCP packet right here. Uh, but you don't see any of this information. Your data might be split apart, which is why you need that backslash R backslash N, that CRLF is to say, this is the end of a line. This is the end of a message. Um, this is another place uh, you might get a short write because TCP itself can't actually hold all of the data that you've asked it to send. You might get a short write because your kernel's buffers are full or uh, some other piece of equipment is, uh, not, can't hold all the data, but TCP itself has some limitations. 
Um, so it might be broken up into multiple packets. However, you're not supposed to care because all those packets eventually get there. Uh, TCP packets have this structure where there's lots of packets are sent without any data in them at all, as far as you're concerned, to get through this state machine where sockets are open, then they're established, then they're closed. Um, during this whole talk, I am only talking about that state. None of the things that happen in this description happen anywhere except in established. So that's where all the data that you might ever care about gets put on, onto or taken off of the wire. Um, you don't have to write any code to deal with these other states. The kernel will take care of them for you. Um, but packets are sent in all of these other states, or at least most of them. Pieces of information are sent that your application does not see. So when you, when you say packet, please remember it's a TCP thing. When you're sending a chunk of information or some bytes of data, that's part of a stream. The illusion is that when you put some data onto the internet and you want to get that same data back out, it comes out. But this illusion is only preserved if you abandon, abandon the idea that you're slinging around whole strings and embrace the idea that each underlying byte is a separate entity that might get sent or not sent um, and broken up and reassembled at any point. Now that we've traversed the internet, we're going to come back th up through the same machinery. Um, some electrical impulses arrive at the Ethernet card. Uh, it generates a hardware interrupt, which tells the kernel to invoke that function that we registered before. So then we're back into the kernel. This calls a hardware-specific function inside the kernel. Now this function, again, uh, this function is interesting because it's an event. You, can't, you could be blocking. Your, your th application could be stopped waiting for this or not. But as far as the kernel's concerned, this function gets called when the Ethernet card has something to do. Um, that second highlighted function kind of scans through the memory in the card and sees what, what has to be done later, and then, or what, what is available to do right now, I should say, um, what data has been received that might be processed. And then uh, an API schedule is the Linux API for taking uh, the collected data and saying, and then when it's appropriate to deliver it to the person who's requesting it, please go ahead and do so. Um, so hopefully somebody's calling receive, and uh, assuming that that application calling receive is a Python application, uh, you'll get right back into socket module.c. Now as we bubble back up through Python socket module, once again, we have to Watch out for Python doing extra helpful stuff. Uh, if the socket has a timeout, we might have to handle a timeout error or potentially other operating system errors. Again, you can see that if is selectable block up at the top there, which is the same block that I highlighted on the previous slide. And finally, the data arrives back at your program. Now, if you're lucky, you'll get all the data that was sent but you're not lucky. Uh, you could get a short read. Now, uh, just as you, when you send it, you have to check to see if you've sent all of the data. You have to check to see if you've received all of the data. And here we can tell we haven't because there's no backslash r backslash n on the end of this string. Um, so you have to make sure that you check to see that you've got an ending of your message there. Um, you need to keep on reading until you're all the way done receiving that message. But then you might get on to the next message if the other side of the wire has been sending uh, for a while. And you have to check to see if the end of your message goes on beyond the end of that message. And you have to have something that's waiting there, looking for all of the appropriate delimiters, making sure that any length prefixes that indicate the length of a packet are honored, not throwing away stuff that comes after the end of the message, buffering it up and waiting for the next message. This is all your responsibility as the author of someone who wants to call a socket function. Um, and uh, I, I really want to dwell on this slide for a second. There's another interesting thing that you probably need to look at here which is that B in front of those strings. Now, this, you'll only get that particular feature in the output of your interpreter if you're using Python 3, 
but it's always with you in spirit. That B prefix <laughs> is, is part of what's happening when you talk to the internet. The internet knows about bytes. It doesn't know about characters, it doesn't know about Unicode. You send bytes, you receive bytes, they're numbers between zero and 255. So when you're dealing with network protocols, you need to be aware that you can't decode something unless you're finished receiving a message. That uh, HEL on the end of that message there, that might be an undecodable partial UTF-8 sequence. And if your code's buggy, it's very unlikely that you will ever actually discover that in practice until you've deployed it in production and have people using it in 100 different languages. Um, so you need to be aware of these issues up front. Now, luckily, there are bits of code that are aware of these issues for you. Uh, the real lesson of this talk is that when you send or receive data over the internet, uh, it might be more challenging than you think, and you should really use a library to help you do it. Now, you know which library you should really use. Uh, but this talk isn't about that, and the program committee didn't approve my talk about that, so... <laughs> Uh, I will mention that there are plenty of others that you can use as well. Uh, any of these is, at least, if not perfectly adequate, at least if you use these, then it's not your fault when you forget to send the right buffer or you forget to truncate your message appropriately or you get a short read or a short write. Um, so, uh, as I said earlier on, socket.send is a murder mystery. You have to find out who killed your data. And if you're doing all of your socket I.O. by hand, if you're calling all these functions yourself and you're not using a library or a server that can handle some of this work for you and make sure it's all done right, there's only one answer to the mystery of who killed your data. And that's what happens to a packet when you send it. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. And... Uh, I really hope that you learned something terrible about networks today. <laughs> so uh, now I can take questions. <laughs> uh, the mic's back there in case anybody wants to walk up. I just wanted to mention real quick, if you have questions, please come to the microphone. So this is a question I should probably know the answer to, but it's been like five years since I took an OS class. Um, could you talk a little bit just about like what's going on between the kernel and the Ethernet card, like that how can the interrupts and all that kind of stuff? Okay, um, so I I tried with those slides to give the high level overview. Um, unfortunately, I, you're right. The the answer to that question is an operating systems class, but the general idea is. Uh, your kernel notices you have an Ethernet card, sets up a function to be called when stuff happens to the Ethernet card, um, and when uh, it's time to write something, when the moons have aligned correctly such that there's buffer space available and there's data ready to send, what your kernel will do is really just do some memory writes to locations in that card, um, which are mapped not to the dims of memory that are actually hooked up to store stuff generally as RAM, but chips of memory that are on the Ethernet card. And then the Ethernet card knows that when you write to those locations, and there's a whole lecture on virtual memory mapping in there somewhere, but the general idea is once it's in there, the Ethernet card knows what to do. The mere act of writing to that memory sends it a command. Is that what you were looking for, or is there more to it? Yeah, no, and then and that, that's when the Ethernet card generates interrupt to go pull stuff from the kernel and do stuff. Right, yeah. The, I mean, the, it's more that the kernel pushes stuff into it because the, the car generates an interrupt. The kernel says, okay, I'm going to push some bytes into you, send these as an Ethernet frame. And then later when bytes arrive again, the, the Ethernet card says, okay, now you have some stuff to receive. The kernel reads some bytes from other memory that's been specially marked on that same card. So the Ethernet card is often generating interrupts saying like, hey, you can write stuff to me now if you want. Yeah, that's happening yeah. all the time. Generally speaking, that's true. I think at the specific level, the exact signals the Ethernet card is sending, they vary by vendor and they vary by capacity and they vary by 
the, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll send you signals like, oh, a, a cable was plugged in and it's full duplex gigabit or things like that, which don't really have to do with sending or receiving. So abstractly, yes. Concretely, this is all completely made up and wrong. Awesome. Thanks. So you mentioned this uh, earlier at the beginning of the talk. Um, what about uh, if I'm doing networking not on Ethernet, but for example on Bluetooth or any other protocol like that? Uh, okay, so if you're doing networking on Bluetooth, that is entirely a different address family, which means that those, those header diagrams that I showed you of the, the data that goes into the P TCP packet, as well as the state machine for what's happening in terms of whether your application thinks a connection is established or not, the semantics are different. Bluetooth has its own specifications that are not TCP. Now, you can do TCP over Bluetooth, yeah. but uh, so your Bluetooth radio is kind of doing a different thing just because Bluetooth is a separate spec. Now, when it comes to uh, a GPRS radio or a Wi-Fi radio, as, excuse me, as long as TCP is the protocol being spoken, it's generally the same. Okay. So basically, so the... The main point of, of what you're trying to say is, is that TCP is uh, not necessarily guarantees what you think it guarantees. So once you're aware of that, and if you're using, I don't know, UDP, for example, or other, th other protocols, um, you're generally fine if you're doing you know, socket programming by yourself. That, that's basically what you're saying. Yeah. OK, thanks. I'm just impressed you got through the whole thing without even saying path MTU. <laughs> Uh, what should I say, path MTU now? Or, uh, actually, I should say path MTU now. Uh, so one of the uh, things, actually, if I could uh, rewind to uh, this slide right here. One of the things that I should have mentioned is, uh, so the path MTU is the maximum transit unit or maximum transport unit over a particular network path. So if I make a socket connection from here to New York, that has a specific maximum size that I can fit stuff into. That maximum size will never be six bytes. It'll always be somewhere around maybe 500 or 1500, something big enough that if you're typing it in at the interactive interpreter, you will never notice a short write or a short read. You will always get exactly the data that you expect because it always just so happens there's enough space in the buffer because you can't type that fast and you can't send that much data. So you should really be aware, you'll never see this. You'll never, if you go and you try it out and say, oh, Glyph doesn't know what he's talking about. Of course I got all my data. You won't get all your data if you stick a little times 5,000 on your send. There, and for extra fun, the path MTU of a local host is completely random and different than everything else and will magically sometimes increase its size to provide you with the facsimile of a system which is relaying packets reliably between two, a send call and a receive call. So don't expect that. When, the reason that I, I like to demonstrate this with little strings is to show this could happen. In particular, if you do a send, and then a send, and then a send, and then a send, you could send a five-character message which gets truncated after the third character. That could happen. But it won't because you're always sending with an empty buffer when you're trying it interactively. So that's, that's really the main point I wanted to get across here, is that at each level, in your kernel, in Python, in, uh, in the network, in your router, in every piece of hardware between you and where you're getting to, something could fail which would cause this to happen. And there are other things that can happen, like receive can raise an exception, but that's the main thing to be aware of, uh, is that you're, you have to have something wh whose job is to put the data together on its, uh, or break the data apart on its way out and pull the data together on its way in. Any other questions? Uh, you know, I'm just curious, you know, um, I know, you know, TCP is a stream, so that this could be happening. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, you know, if you type in uh, your, you know, machine, you never see that kind of situation. Is there any way to test those kind of, you know, um, to store this, you know, your pro my program to, to see this kind of, you know, situation cause problem or not? So, uh, I, there, there isn't really a, a nice built-in tool to, to, do, to generate those kinds of scenarios. Um, one, one thing you can do, and this was on, um, I don't know if T Tarek is here, but on Tarek uh, Ziada's blog, there is a nice description of a bug that they encountered at Mozilla where uh, they were using some web framework and G-Event 
and the web framework was calling socket.send, which happened to work, but when you put gevent in there, suddenly it, the sockets were non-blocking, so it was returning much earlier. So I believe if you're doing just regular blocking I.O. and you want to see what happens, swapping out your I.O. layer, using a gevent if you're using blocking sockets, or switching to eventlet if you're normally using gevent, just to see if there's any differences. So it won't be comprehensive, but switching out your socket module is always a good idea if you want to see what happens when something weird happens. Yeah? So continuing to talk about async, um, if I write a very large amount of data to a non-blocking socket in Twisted or Tornado, um, will they generally raise exceptions if there's not enough buffer in the lower layers? Um, or will they buffer it in Python's own uh, heap? So uh, I'll answer for Twisted. Um, what Twisted will do if you write too much data is it will silently buffer it. Uh, the idea being, if you're writing a large amount of data, that means you already have a string that's a large amount of data. So you all, you've already paid the price. It's already in memory. So there's no point in blowing up at some lower level. Um, and in fact, that's kind of the point of, of Twisted's transport.write interface is we'll get the data there. Your job is done. That said, Twisted does have an interface called uh, iProducer and uh, iConsumer where you can register a producer for a socket. And uh, there are two modes. One mode, it will call you when the buffer is empty to say, give me some more data. And another mode where it'll call you when the buffer's full to say, stop writing so much data to me. Um, Tornado will do something, but I won't be liable for it. OK, thanks. So um, I noticed that you, you didn't mention something. Perhaps it no longer applies. There used to be a, a quirk with certain OSs where writing uh, new lines into a TCP socket would trigger a special kind of flush that would guarantee that you would always be reading on line boundaries from sockets. Um, so I'm not familiar with that feature. I don't know uh, what OSs or versions it affected, if any. But there are fundamental, and I can see some of my friends who know TCP well squinting and, and uh, looking at the ceiling. Uh, there are fundamental limitations to the protocol and to the way that things work that would make that impossible, generally speaking. It might guarantee, in the sense it would make some kind of best effort attempt, but uh, that's not something that you could ever rely on, even, because even if your platform was really rigorous about it for some reason, which doesn't sound like a good idea, uh, you don't know who you're talking to. And so the rules of TCP are all that apply when you're making network connections. So there's never any reason to assume that if your transport only uses lines that are always ended with new lines, that it'll be safe to always read a line every single time? Um, nope, that is not safe. Um, and, uh, and because if you think about it, if your line, if, if the maximum transport unit is a certain size and your line is bigger than that size, it's going to give up and just deliver however much data it can um, before it sees that new line. So uh, because there are many protocols that don't use new lines as a delimiter and therefore would not be able to, wouldn't work at all on a platform that actually buffered until that was possible. Um, one more comment, though, just on the Tornado thing. Um, torna one of the reasons that Twisted is awesome is that uh, Tornado and Async Core and many other frameworks of that ilk have a socket module or a socket object which you must communicate with. So they propagate all of the platform semantics and weirdnesses up to you. And I believe that Tornado is the same way. So I think that you might get an exception or you might get a short write or something else might happen is, is the general answer, at least for S and Core, probably also for Tornado. Okay, thank you. Thank you.